Jewish Education and Media is pleased to present L'Chaim, a program that highlights the people, issues, and events of importance to the Jewish community. Now here is your host, Rabbi Mark Golub. I'm Mark Golub. And how many members of the Supreme Court of the United States today are Jewish? In the history of the U.S. Supreme Court, how many Jews have served in that august body? And do you know who was the first Jew to be named to the Supreme Court? Do you know who the first Jew to be nominated for the Supreme Court was? I'll give you a hint of that one. He was nominated by President Millard Fillmore, who, in case you don't remember, was the 13th President of the United States way back in 1853. Well, if you're a history buff, or if you simply find American Jewish history fun and fascinating, you want to pick up a book entitled Jewish Justices of the Supreme Court, a delightful, easy read that takes you from the first Jewish Supreme Court nominee to the three esteemed Jewish individuals who, as we sit at our Al-Khayim table today, currently sit on the highest court of our land, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Justice Stephen G. Breyer, and Justice Elena Kagan. And it's a book written by an historian who also happens to be a rabbi. David Dolan was the co-editor and author of 11 books, including Religion and State, the American Jewish Experience, which he co-authored with Jonathan Sarna, and the Presidents of the United States and the Jews. David Dolan, a conservative rabbi with both a master's degree and PhD from Brandeis University, has taught Jewish studies at several universities, including the Jewish Theological Seminary of America, the Conservative Movement's Rabbinical School, where David received his smicha, and George Washington University. And David has written extensively on many aspects of American Jewish history and politics, and on Jewish Christian relations, including a book entitled the Myth of Hitler's Pope, How Pope Pius XII Rescued Jews from the Nazis. David, it's such an honor and pleasure to have you sitting at this table. Thank you for joining us. Mark, thank you. I, it's an honor for me. I, I must tell you, my wife and I are such big fans of JBS. Oh. And we, I was going to say, to use the term, we watch it religiously. <laughs> and uh, we're, we're so, um, uh, we have such Gratitude to you for, you know, for, this is such a wonderful contribution, and I'm honored to be here with you. To that is lovely of you to say to me. Yeah. Where do you live? We live in Boca Raton, Florida. And on which television provider do you watch? We, uh, we watch it on Hotwire. Very nice. Yeah. What's your wife's name? My wife's name is Miriam Dallin, uh, Miriam, and she's a published American Jewish historian in her own right. By the way, I should have known that because you dedicated the book to yeah. Miriam. How long have you been married? Uh, we've been married now for eight years. Lovely. Yeah. Lovely. And she is the, she's written the commissioned history of the American Jewish Committee and also, as I say, um, is the country's leading authority on Jewish fraternities and sororities. She's written two books about That's it. wonderful. Uh, and I told you before we begin, you have written a spectacular book. And what I found to be true about your book, David, is that Every page tells me something about American Jewish history. Interesting in one respect when I read about, you know, the periods of the 19th century, yeah. where yeah. obviously I had no personal involvement at all. And then it goes right up through the 1960s and 70s and 80s, right till today. And there's so many things that, first of all, resonate with me in terms of what I'm reading, but also... It turns out all of us only knew a fraction of 
what was going on and how were Supreme Court justices chosen and both the politics and the personal relationships right. which right. led. So you have done us a service by writing this book. Thank you very much for a beautiful, well-written, easily readable book. Thank you so much. I, I'm grateful. Um, tell me just a little bit about yourself, then we go to the book. I know you're a conservative rabbi. Right. Where did you grow up? I grew up in San Francisco. I come from a family of rabbis. I say it's a family business, <laughs> although I'm the one who went into academia. Um, born and raised in San Francisco, went to uh, UC Berkeley uh, as an undergraduate, uh, then uh, went to um, uh, actually Brandeis University and had uh, received my PhD there, my MA and PhD, and then I'd always intended to uh, become a rabbi also. A so, pulpit rabbi? Uh, well, that's interesting. At first I, I did, and I went to JTS and I was ordained, and I've, but I've uh, really been much more in academia and uh, writing my, I think much more of my work has been as, a, as an American Jewish historian. Okay. I've had pulpits over the years. Have you? Uh, Part-time pulpits. Um, uh, high holiday pulpits. Uh, I do a lot of scholar and residence uh, work, but I've never actually had a, a full time, full -time congregation. Memory. Okay. You've done historical work. Yeah. yeah okay. Quite a bit. Um, and as you're growing up, you're, in terms of who your parents were, are you an only child? No. I have a brother. Uh, Ralph, who's a rabbi in San Diego. Everywhere you looked at rabbis in your family? Everywhere. My father, you know, it, uh, my, my father was um, my grandfather, great-grandfather. It's interesting. I'm a conservative rabbi. My father's father was the Mashkiach Ruchani at the Slobodka Yeshiva. Really? You yeah. know that my grandfather studied the Slobodka wow. Yeshiva. We are connected. We are connected. This that is, is a, marvelous. Yeah. Was your father an Orthodox rabbi? My father had Orthodox smicha, and when he started out in Brooklyn, he uh, had um, an Orthodox. He uh, was. He had an Orthodox congregation. After going into the chaplaincy in World War II, which is an interesting story in and of itself, he, when he came back, he took a conservative congregation. He had met at, um, uh, actually in Camp Massad, he had met many people from JTS, the late Moshe Davis and others. And um, he then uh, uh, came out to California and had a conservative congregation for many years. Where? In San Francisco. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, did you know Harold Schulweis? Of course, of Encino? course. Yeah, um, he was he was in Oakland for many years before, and he, he and his wife were very close friends of my parents. Well, they were extraordinary people, yeah. also. Yeah. Uh, and who influenced you when you were at JTS? Well, I guess uh, the interesting, um, uh, the late Gerson Cohen, I think, in particular, I would say who um, was just a wonderful person. And uh, I, and um, also Ismar Shosh uh, did as well. Uh, and I must say, um, I would say Gerson Cohen is uh, first okay. and foremost, but I must say two of the biggest influences on me were reform rap. I, were, um, courses I had with um, Norman Cohen and uh, uh, Lawrence, uh, Larry Hoffman. Larry Hoffman. Um, who, and I say jokingly, they were two of the best um, uh, classes I had at JTS. They were visiting professors, uh, Cohen and Midrash and Hoffman and Liturgy. In fact, the first article I ever published in the Journal of Reform Judaism was a paper I wrote for Larry Hoffman. Really? Many years ago, yeah. Um, and why Midrash? I mean, uh, here on JBS, we're talking about Midrash all the time. Many Jews don't even know what Midrash is. Yeah. Uh, there are rabbis who, it's just not where they are and they don't convey a midrashic rabbinic mm. approach. And here you are, conservative, you're, you're studying at JTS, your father was an Orthodox rabbi, you had an Orthodox tradition. Yes. Midrash comes out of classical Talmudic teaching, sure, sure. and yet there are many, even observant Jews, who are very unfamiliar with Midrash. You okay. say to me, at JTS, Norman Cohen, Yes. Who was in school with me and yeah. has been on. And was a wonderful teacher and a mentor. Fabulous. Mensch, and a mentor fabulous. A person. fabulous. Yeah. How did, why does Norman have the effect on you? Well, he was just such a wonderful teacher and such a mensch. Um, and I think that was it. I'm not, Midrash is not my field, I will confess. I mean, it's, I, if you ask me honestly, why did I take it? It was a required course. Okay. <laughs> but I learned so much from him. And he was, I guess. Um, you learned so much about what? Um, 
about the what midrash is, and um, I, I, you know, I. It's interesting. This was many years ago, of course. Uh, when I think back, this was the 1980s, and when I took the class with he him, was a kid. Yeah, yeah, he was. I was. I didn't have any of my distinguished gray or white hair then. Um, but I, to be honest, um, I didn't know much what midrash was, and he had such a way of teaching it. And um, and he's a wonderful writer himself. And I guess. Um, it, he made me interested in it to a certain yeah. degree. It's a fascinating dynamic for yeah. me that you come out of a more traditional form of Judaism, form of Judaism, yeah. and yet, as you say, you did you had no exposure before that to Midrash. No, none whatsoever. And Midrash conveys the thinking of the Jewish tradition. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So, how do you become interested in history? Ah. Okay, I've always been interested in history. I started out in San Francisco. Uh, I loved San Francisco history generally and San Francisco Jewish history in particular. In fact, I probably have the foremost library in Boca Raton, Florida on San Francisco history. Now, um, the interest in this book, um, I'm, most of my work in, over the years um, has been in, Ameri in the field of American Jewish history. I, um, I've written a great deal on uh, um, the presidents of the United States and the Jews. I've co-authored a book with the late Alfred Kolatch, who I'm sure you knew, and um, I've, but I've written several articles on Jews and the American presidency. What do you think it is that triggered in you the uh, interest in history? Well, my parents, my father was always very interested in history. Um, and he had majored in history in NYU when he first uh, came to the States from Lithuania. Um, and I guess, um, I'll tell you honestly, I haven't thought about this in a long time. I remember when my parents gave me, a, a, I must have been eight or nine years old, um, a, uh, um, the, what is it, the, um, the World Book, I guess it was the World Book Encyclopedia or the Britannica. I read it from one from its cover entire, to cover? cover to cover. Wow. And that just got me interested. And I had always been interested. I know you're a baseball fan. Baseball history is one of my great, uh, you know, I've written, I, it's not on my, it is on some of my resumes, articles about Hank Greenberg and Sandy Koufax. And in fact, when my son, who's now a law student, um, when he was learning, uh, he wasn't much of a reader, so I got him in, um, a uh, biographies baseball biographies uh, published by the Jewish Publication Society of Mo Berg, of Hank Greenberg and others, and that made him a reader. Yes. But I guess starting out actually San Francisco history okay. was my first love and then my first interest and then just gravitating even in terms of my own family's history, which I found increasingly interesting going back to Lithuania and Eastern Europe and uh, and so it evolved then, and my friendship with Jonathan Sauna, who is one of my oldest friends, and, um, and other friends. Um, so yeah, it's been, um, it's been a love. And, and a I, lifelong passion. And a lifelong passion. And I can honestly say this book was a labor of love. Okay. I want to ask you about one other book, the book you wrote before this ah, in 2013. Yes. It's The Life and Perennial Candidacy oh. <laughs> of the Progressive <laughs> Republican. Does that in any way indicate your own leaning? Not, not really. No, it was a um, Harold Stassen, who <laughs> most people listening to L'Chaim may not know who he was. He was um, uh, my, my oldest friend. My two old, oldest friends are Jonathan Sauner and my friend John Rothman in San Francisco, who I grew up with, is now a radio talk show host. He has a private library of um, political biography in America, uh, of over 15,000 volumes. We've always been interested to, uh, about Harold Stassen. Harold Stassen, the boy governor of uh, Minnesota at the age of 30, uh, at one point was a serious presidential candidate and later became somewhat of a joke. He, he would run every, every four years. And people forget how seriously he was taken in a bygone era. And we had discovered, uh, my friend John Rothman and I, that and um, John Rothman had um, collected everything about Stassen. No one had ever written about him. He had been completely forgotten. He was kind of a character also. So we decided with someone else, we wrote a, uh, a political biography of Harold Stassen, have nothing, having nothing to do with uh, Jewish studies right. or Jewish history. It, um, 
uh, it did not become a bestseller, even in Minnesota. But I can say that it probably is, will stand uh, for a while as being the definitive work on its subject. Very nice. Because I'm not sure if anyone else will bother to write anything about Stassen. But why would you write about progressive Republicans? Oh, oh yeah. Well, I guess um, the idea was that this, he was part of a bygone era in the Republican Party that's no longer with us. He was part of an era of when you had liberal Republicans, um, uh, obviously Nelson Rockefeller, uh, Bill Scranton, Elliot Richardson. There was, um, and he was part of that era before, um, uh, you know, he emerged well before um, Goldwater and the Goldwater phenomenon, well before Ronald Reagan. And it was an era when you had a decidedly liberal win mm -hmm. in, within the Republican Party. Yeah. And, um, and, that's, and that's certainly part of history now. Yes. And that was one of the things to remind people that there was once a different Republican Party. Good for now, you. Now, this was written, by the way, years before anyone imagined that Trump would be elected yes, president. Yes, it was 2013. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have one more philosophical question ah, for you. Sure, sure. Because in a moment we're going to talk about Jewish justices of the Supreme Court. Wonderful. I want to know your, if you have, a judicial philosophy. And on the Supreme Court, mm. the way it's popularized is there's two basic approaches. Mm. There's the founding fathers literalist approach, yeah, yeah. the originalist, the originalist approach, approach yeah. and there is the activist approach. Yeah. And you do, but one of the wonderful things you do in this book is you explain for us where the various judges right. that you're talking about stood on that issue. Yeah. Do you, it would be good for you to just explain to our audience the difference between the originalist and the activist, which you know as a rabbi comes right out of the Talmudic discussion yeah, as well. It certainly does. I, of, I often use the Talmud, no, I'm sorry, I use the Supreme Court and it's the way it, it's dynamic and the way it operates to teach Jews who have no concept of what the Talmud is, yeah, yeah. what the Talmud is. Yeah. The Supreme Court is a modern adaptation of the Talmudic process. Yeah, yeah. Explain to our viewers and then tell me where you stand on the issue of originalist versus activist in terms of Supreme Court judicial philosophy. Well, it's interesting because um, the whole issue of ju judicial activism or judicial restraint as, uh, as opposed to it, yeah, the originalist position, the quintessential representative of that, I guess, was Justice uh, Scalia, the late Justice Scalia, that everything has to be attested to in the, you know, in the, essentially in the text of the Constitution. Or it's the textualist or the originalist. Uh, um, and um, then the, obviously the, act, the kind of approach, let's say, that Brandeis had was that, was also in terms of, uh, comparing to Jewish law, that it evolves over time. Absolutely. It evolves in response, especially this was Brandeis, to changing social circumstances, changing economic realities. So whereas that, you know, um, the, as uh, I think Mordechai Kaplan once said that, you know, in terms of uh, halakha, it gives us a vote, not a veto. But here, the idea is that starting with Brandeis and with most of the justices, with perhaps one exception, the idea that um, the uh, judicial opinions and judicial decisions and should um, evolve in response to new realities. I mean, one of the things that, uh, you know, um, there's a wonderful new biography of uh, Brandeis by uh, Jeffrey um, Rosen, who wrote one of the blurbs for my book, and he taught things that were unimagined. Brandeis himself talked about the changes in technology um, and how that would affect uh, the evolution of uh, judicial decision making. And that's certainly the case today. Now, this was something never imagined by the founding fathers and never imagined in, uh, or thought of in, a, in an originalist conception of the court. Now, what's interesting is Frankfurter, all of the justices, the Jewish justices, by the way, were appointed by Democratic presidents, with the exce one exception of Cardozo, who was appointed by Herbert Hoover, which I don't, I'll just maybe tell the story now and go back to your question. Um, you know, Cardozo was a lifelong Democrat. He had supported Al Smith in the 1928 presidential race against Hoover, and yet Hoover appointed him to the court. And um, 
uh, it's, you know, Hoover didn't have the greatest presidency. Um, and many, most historians say that one of the, his appointment of Cardozo was one of the greatest achievements of his presidency. But what's interesting, going back to the activists, most of the, uh, the Jewish justices have been activists in whatever um, sense. Now, um, Frankfurter, who had been a leading flaming liberal, a, um, uh, uh, one of the great defenders of Sacco and Vanzetti and every left-leaning li uh, liberal cause. Uh, he was as a law professor at Harvard. By the way, the only Jewish law professor at Harvard from 1914 till his appointment to the Supreme Court in 1939. But he was the quintessential activist, liberal activist. FDR appoints him to the court. When he retires in 1962, he's the most conservative member of the Warren Court. And he's, he's, a, he's a prophet of judicial restraint. How did that happen? It's, it's an amazing story. He evolved, you know, one of the things about um, Supreme Court appointments is, of course, that they're lifetime appointments. That's why it's the, the uh, most presidents try to appoint judges at younger ages. By the way, uh, Neil Gorsuch is exactly the same age as his appointment as Elena Kagan was, 49 approaching 30, 50. With good health, they'll be on the court 30 years. Um, now, um, the, what is not, what is sometimes forgotten is the many justices go change, you know, liberal justice, liberal presidents presumably appoint uh, justices who exemplify their liberal ju uh, jurisprudence and philosophy. Now, the best, uh, but if, you're, if you have a lifetime appointment, you can change and surprise the president who appoint you. The best example of this, when uh, Eisenhower appointed Earl Warren, Earl Warren had been the conservative Republican governor of California, Thomas Dewey's running mate in 1948 as vice president. Um, Dwight Eisenhower later said it was the big, biggest mistake of his uh, presidency appointing Earl Warren. I think if FDR had... Because he becomes known as the quintessential activist exactly. Chief Supreme the Court the quintessential Justice. activist and civil libertarian mm -hmm. in, of the 20th century, I would mm -hmm. think. Mm -hmm. And um, he was not appointed on the, for that reason. Now, I think if FDR had lived, he would have said the same thing about Felix Frankfurter. And feel, in fact, Felix Frankfurter was hoping that John F. Ke President Kennedy would appoint uh, one of his... Uh, uh, law clerks um, who would who would continue to be um, follow in a judicial judicial restraint is the opposite of judicial activism, and um, but Kennedy instead appointed made a very good appointment Arthur Goldberg, yes. who was much who was also a quintessential activist. Yeah, and in and terms, he stayed. Uh, yes, he stayed an activist. He remained an activist right. throughout and even after he was on the court. So sadly, su such a short tenure. But as you say, it's it's very much if you look at reform and conservative Judaism, how um, you can have a, hal uh, a halachic process that responds to new social and economic realities. And uh, that's what uh, judicial activism has been a part, uh, is in a, in a large part. Okay, let's talk about some individuals. Sure. I want you to be, again, every story in your book is so fascinating. So. I want you to begin by talking about the first Jew to be nominated yes, to the Supreme yes, yes, Court, yes. but who never became a Supreme Court Justice. A wonderful story. Okay, Judah Benjamin, Judah P. Benjamin, not a household word today. He was the first professing Jew to serve in the United States Senate. Um, he represented Louisiana in the 1850s. He was one of the great 19th century orators in the, you know, on a par with, um, uh, with Daniel Webster, with Henry Clay, uh, with, uh, he's usually considered, he was a charismatic orator. Um, and um, he was the first uh, Jewish uh, in New Orleans, where he wasn't much of a practicing Jew, but he was the leading Jewish personality in New Orleans. And, um, he was, uh, in 1853, um, Millard Fillmore, who, as you kind of said, was not one of our greatest presidents, offered him the um, uh, nomination to the Supreme Court. Now he turned it down to stay in the Senate. 
he wanted to stay in the Senate, and, um, and how history might have been different had he taken the court appointment. By the way, part of the reason he turned it down, um, he could not, he had a tremendously lucrative law practice, which he was able then to continue while in the Senate. He couldn't while on the court. Seven years later, he was a, um, a, a passionate Southerner and yes. um, had a major plantation. He, um, when Louisiana left the Union, he did. He became in rapid succession um, Attorney General, Secretary of War, and Secretary of State of the Confederacy. Now, a hundred years before Henry Clay, uh, Henry Clay, Henry Kissinger, he was the first Jewish Secretary of State, albeit, and how, what do we say, not a kosher government, the Confederate States of America. But two unique things about him also. He, um, by the way, he's the only American Jew whose picture is on a piece of American currency on a Confederate $2 bill, which I would suggest is a great collector's item. I have one at home. And also, he, he, ha he, was, he escaped. He, um, uh, like Jefferson Davis and other leaders of the Confederacy, he, could have been, he might have been arrested and imprisoned. He escaped in disguise, and through a whole set of circumstances that I discuss in my book, he arrived penniless in London, and then he emerged in the next 20 years. He developed a whole new uh, career as one of the leading barristers in London. And he was considered one of uh, Queen Victoria's favorite barristers. It's a fascinating story. Most of us don't know that Judah P. Benjamin, first of all, you're right, most people don't know the name, yeah. but those of us who know the name did not know he was offered the Supreme Court nominee, uh, seat. Then you talk about Louis Marshall, Louis uh, Marshall. Yeah, Louis Marshall. What a fabulous story. Tremendous. And when you read about Louis Marshall in your book, all the names that are associated with him yeah. are all the outstanding names of that generation, the Schiffs and the Salzburgers, exactly, and Stephen Wise. Um, okay, talk to me about Louis Marshall. Okay, Louis Marshall um, was was probably one of, or if not the uh, preeminent constitutional lawyer in um, New York during his lifetime. He was born in 1856. Uh, by the way, so was uh, Louis Brandeis. Uh, uh, Jonathan Saunders written a story of two Louis. Um, and uh, so was, by the way, um, uh, Woodrow Wilson, who appointed Brandeis, all a few weeks from each other. Uh, Marshall grew up in Syracuse. He came to New York. He was a prodigy. He graduated uh, Columbia Law School in a year and a half. He went back to Syracuse to practice. He then came back. Uh, in 1894 to New York to join what was then one of the two or three biggest Jewish law firms. In, and uh, this was the era which I talk about in which uh, there were so many Jewish law firms because it was still very rare for uh, Jews, Jewish attorneys, no matter how brilliant, to get um, uh, positions in the uh, blue, ch blue shoe or the uh, Gentile law firms. Now he comes and um, he becomes, by the way, a mentor of uh, Benjamin Cardozo, which is interesting, and a close friend of his, which is a, another interesting story. He, um, it's the, um, uh, the law firm is, uh, what is it, um, Marsh, uh, something um, Untermeyer and Marshall. Um, and uh, over the next couple of decades, he becomes not only one of the most respected um, attorneys, um, in New York state, City and State, but also one of the preeminent Jewish communal leaders. He's the president of the American That's Jewish right. Committee yep. from 19... He, he succeeds Mayor Sulzberger in 1912, from 1912 until his death in 1929. Um, He's on the board of governors of the Jewish Theological Seminary. Which he helped to create. Which he helped to create, as did Jacob Schiff yes. and, uh, and uh, Mayor Sulzberger. This was a remarkable Jewish generation. Oh, it was. It was. Wasn't it? It was almost like the founding fathers yeah, in American that's right, history. of America. Uh, in, a, in, a, in the American experience. You know, the, um, he was also president of Temple Emanuel. Jacob Schiff and Louis Marshall were reformed Jews, but who shaped the, the Jewish Theological Seminary. They, they brought Solomon Schechter here from England, who had been the uh, lead, reader yes. in rabbinics. The in irony is you have two outstanding reformed Jewish leaders creating conservative Judaism. That's right, that's right. And, and saving. And saving. And saving and conserving in this sense. You know, in, in, that, in that sense, conservative. Now, what's interesting, he was tremendously influential politically. He was a Republican. This was the era when so many of these prominent Jews, 
Jacob Schiff, he, the Warburgs, were all Republicans. Yes, by the way, the way you write about it in the book, yeah. there is, and again, it resonates with today. You understand yes. that, yeah, David? very much so. There's this fight between Wilson and Taft, and which Jewish leaders are lining up to support That's right. Wilson That's right. or Taft. That's right. Talk about that. Well, most of the Jewish leaders had been Republicans who had strongly supported uh, um, Teddy Roosevelt and Taft, including, by the way, uh, Julius Rosenwald, the founder of Sears Roebuck, who Taft, had he been reelected, probably would have appointed Secretary of Commerce. Um, but uh, Jacob Schiff, Felix Warburg, um, uh, all the rest of Mayor Salzberger, who was particularly close to Taft, and it relates to why um, uh, Louis Marshall didn't get on the Supreme Court, which I'll tell you about in a second. But what's sometimes forgotten is Brandeis, Louis Brandeis voted for Taft in 1908. Brandeis's favorite, uh, his uncle, um, uh, Louis Dembitz, who was an Orthodox Jewish attorney and legal scholar in um, uh, Kentucky, in Louisville, Kentucky, he was a, one of the founders of the Republican Party in Kentucky and, uh, and was at the Republican National uh, Party Convention that nominated Lincoln in 1860. And uh, by the way, that's why Louis Brandeis's middle name was initially David. David. He changed it to Dembitz in honor of his uh, uncle, his favorite uncle. So you had most of the Jewish Republicans. Jacob Schiff went so far as to say in 1904 he could not imagine any Jew, any eligible Jew to vote would not vote for Teddy Roosevelt. So what happens? Um, 1912, they divide up. For the first time, um, Jacob Schiff votes for a Democrat, and Henry Morgenthau Sr., by the way, the grandfather of Robert Morgenthau, of course, the long time, who's still alive. At District United, Attorney. District of Attorney New of New York uh, City. Um, most of these Jewish Republicans uh, began to support um, uh, Wilson, with two exceptions, Louis Marshall, and I want to come back to Marshall again, and Julius Rosenwald. Um, now, uh, So most Jews begin to go Democrat. Yes. Louis Marshall remains a staunch Republican. A staunch Republican who, by the way, had started, taught himself Yiddish and started a Yiddish newspaper with a Repu Republican-leaning Yiddish, Yiddish newspaper for the Lower East Side to persuade the Yiddish immigrants that they might vote Republican. He had, and he actually, in his, he must have been 50 years old or close to it, he taught himself Yiddish. Amazing. Which is amazing. But one interesting thing, so um, the, there's a hiatus there. Jews were basically Republicans, and this is what's forgotten, you know, um, from the time of Lincoln until 1928 and certainly 1932. 1928, Jews begin to move to the Democratic Party when Al Smith runs, and then uh, FDR brings Jews into the Democratic Party. Now, of course, it was a very different Republican Party in that era. I've often thought of writing a book on when Jews were Republican, about that era from the Civil War to oh, 1928. You should. You it's, it's a whole different era, a different Republican Party. But um, what's interesting, you have the hiatus under... Um, uh, under Woodrow Wilson, when a lot of the Jewish machers and a lot of the Jewish philanthropists and the big names switched to um, Wilson. Now, before, and I, I, maybe I can talk a little bit, if you'd like, about the relation, how Brandeis came to Wilson, but one interesting thing about Louis Marshall, he was so politically influential, but the only position he really wanted and f really was a seat on the Supreme Court. Yes. He never considered anything else. In, 19, in um, <coughs> 1910, a, um, there was an effort, a lobbying effort, led by Schiff and uh, Mayor Salzberger to ask Taft to nominate um, uh, Marshall to the Supreme Court. Now, by the way, the closest Jew in the country to uh, um, Taft was Mayor Salzberger. Mayor Salzberger was uh, a judge and a very uh, uh, devout Jew. He, he later wrote books on uh, biblical scholarship in retirement. He was the first cousin of Cyrus Adler, um, and he was the first president of the American Jewish Committee. There's a whole correspondence between him and Taft. And the Salzberger family, of course, becomes a major yes. force in American Jewish life. Of course, and he's, he is related to the Salzburgers of the New York, well, Times, the New York Times. Of the New York Times, but living and based in Philadelphia. So um, he requests, and there's a letter to uh, Taft, um, if uh, he could come with Jacob Schiff 
and one or two other prominent Jewish Republicans to discuss a matter of uh, importance. So they set, they make the case for Louis Marshall's appointment. This is 1910. Now bear in mind, if Marshall had been appointed, there probably never would have been a Brandeis appointment in 1916. But uh, Taft doesn't give them much time. First of all, he's outraged. Why? Marshall is a, a partner of uh, Unter Untermeyer. Louis, um, what's Untermeyer's first name? Um, maybe Lewis also, who was one of the big critics of Taft and who was what, um, and uh, they, they just didn't get along. And he said, um, uh, if he says to, um, to Schiff, if you were me, would you appoint Untermeyer's law partner to the Supreme Court? What was not known then, and this is a fascinating story, he had already decided on his appointment. It was Charles Evans Hughes, the governor of New York. And, why, and that decision had been made before they came to Washington to lobby for Marshall. And why did he want um, uh, Hughes on the court? Hughes was a very prominent Republican who in all likelihood might have run against him for president in 1912. He wanted to get him out of the uh, presidential sweepstakes. So by, and he knew that uh, Hughes would, had always wanted to be on the court. So by appointing him, he had one less competitor. But so, in other words, it was never even taken seriously. Interesting. By the way, parenthetically, yeah. it's what I mentioned earlier. Your book shows us how often it is not only political shenanigans and self-interests which motivate who becomes a Supreme Court justice. Yeah. There are personalities Very and so. personal relationships yes, yes. either work for or against. Correct? Correct. Exactly. Yeah. And in, in some way, what you're talking about is, it turns out Taft had his own political reasons right. for Hughes. Yeah. But he also had personal reasons not to appoint Point Marshall. Marshall. In fact, he said that if he, if he were going to appoint a Jew, it would be Mayor Salzberger, who he felt very close to. They, and, uh, they Which would have made sense in some way. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. All right. Do you know, by the way, is Marshall crushed, or does he understand it and move well, on? Well, I think he was profoundly disappointed, is probably a good way of putting it. Mm -hmm. That was his one dream, if he would have had. You know, and he, he had a tremendous influence behind the scenes in New York politics, generally. Uh, but that was the one thing that he kind of, I wouldn't say coveted, but let's say would have loved to have had. Okay. But so after Marshall, lo and behold, we do get... Yes. The first Supreme Court justice who was Jewish and who, you'll tell me if I'm going too far, establishes in the minds of America a Jewish seat yes. on the Supreme Court. Yes. Which for a while is sort of like becomes a legacy. A legacy. Okay. So Until 1969 when Nixon um, re replaced Abe Fortas with Harry Blackman, a Protestant. And we have no Jewish Supreme Court justice at that point. Until Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Okay. So there have been eight Jewish Supreme Court justices up till now. Yes. yes. Name them in order. Okay. Louis D. Brandeis, Benjamin Cardozo, Felix Frankfurter, Arthur Goldberg, Abe Fortas, then Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Stephen Breyer, and Elena Kagan. Okay. So tell the story. I mean, most people know the name Louis Brandeis, Louis Brandeis. Yeah. Brandeis University is named for him. Right, right. Uh, he was not simply a great American just the Supreme Court. He was a great American Jew who had yeah. profa he was profoundly uh, supportive of, defensive of the Jewish community. Very much so. Becomes Zionist early in the whole process. Yeah. Talk about how he becomes who he is, well, okay. who is he, and how does he become well, he's the first Jewish Supreme Court well, Justice? it's fascinating in many ways. I, I'll talk about the paradox of his Jewishness also. Yes. And maybe that's the way to start. You're right. He celebrates Christmas. Yes. Let me start with that. Okay. And then to go on to his, his greatnesses and how, how, and also the anti-Semitism yes. when he was nominated. But let me talk about his a Jewishness. A fascinating story. Because you could it, have written a book about just Brandeis. Yes. Oh, I think so. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. No, Brandeis, it's interesting. When you think of the first Jewish justice, you think a Jewish. He's Jewish. Well, he grew up in Louisville, Kentucky. His parents were German-speaking uh, immigrants from Prague. They uh, were... 
had no Jewish traditions in their home. His mother famously said at one point that she respected the, uh, the, um, uh, the ethics of all uh, religions, but the rituals or observances of none. He was raised and his family celebrating Christmas, never going to shul on uh, uh, Shabbat or any holidays. But he, did, he was exposed to traditional Judaism through his uncle, Louis Dembitz who was an Orthodox Jew, actually. And, he, and Louis Brandeis later wrote, you know, as a young man, very nostalgically about the Shabbat, the few Shabbats he spent at his home. But he did not emulate his uncle in that way. He, it was his uncle who inspired him to uh, pursue a, cure, a career of law. And by the way, his uncle, as an Orthodox Jew, was a, a, um, a passionate abolitionist, named two of his sons, um, Henry Clay Dembitz, and Abraham Lincoln Dembitz, which is interesting. But so Louis Brandeis, he married, his wife was Jewish, and that's, uh, that's not taken for granted with the Jewish justices. It was a cousin of his, Alice Goldmark. But they celebrate uh, Christmas at home, um, and they celebrate, in fact, I'll just share with you uh, two anecdotes. Um, I, he was a, a, a prolific correspondent. Uh, Brandeis, and uh, he, um, in 1900, his two young daughters are in um, uh, Air of Christmas, a few days before Christmas, so to speak, they're in New York, and he writes to them assuring him that when you get back next week, the Christmas tree is here and Santa Claus will be awaiting you. Now, the other thing that's so amazing is um, he, he was very close to his brother Alfred, who remained in uh, uh, Louisville. Every month to six weeks, his brother Alfred would send him a ham. And he would send him these letters back, Louis Brandeis, saying, our home was overjoyed. The ham arrived. It's so wonderful. Thank you again. Now, there were no hams in Boston, which I always wonder. But this was it. He was, throughout his life, one might almost say, glot traif. And so to speak. In fact, when when uh, Cardozo moves to Washington, when he's appointed, and he grew up in the uh, Sephardic in the the, um, the Spanish Portuguese synagogue, when the Brandeises appoint uh, off, oh, um, invite him for the first time for a meal, and they serve ham, he was more than a little taken aback. But what happens though, so Brandeis, the first 50 years of his life, he has no connection with Jewish life, with Jewish communal life. Almost, he has Jew, Jewish friends, all German Jews. Then what happens, and just very briefly, at the, um, he, uh, he arbitrates the um, garments workers' uh, strike in 1910, he, uh, actually together with Louis Marshall. And for the first time, is exposed to um, East European Jews. He's fascinated by them, and um, uh, he had, who we, he had never been exposed to before. And from that, he gains an interest, he starts to get an interest in Zionism. And there were several people I talk in the book who influenced him. And by 1914, he assumes the leadership of the American Zionist movement. And that's a story into itself. It's, it's been called his conversion to Zionism. And um, it's amazing. He was a charismatic figure. In fact, he was so, and then we'll go to his court case. In 1917, he was instrumental in persuading Wilson and the Wilson administration to back the Gal Balfour Declaration 100 years ago this November. Mm -hmm. He was so immersed in that that for, he briefly considered resigning from the court to devote himself full time to Zionist work. Mm -hmm. he, he was persuaded not to. Now, he was a lifelong Republican. Um, he was a lifelong Republican until Wilson. Until, that's what, that's yeah. what he changes yes. with Woodrow Wilson. He changes with Woodrow Wilson. Why? He's fascinated by Woodrow Wilson's first on his campaign, his um, economic philosophies. He was a you know he was a he was a progressive Republican, um, uh, Brandeis before, and there was such a thing that there were there was La, La Follette, the senator from Wisconsin, and others, and and um, he first became interested by Wilson's speeches when he was running for president in the early campaign, and um, uh, what eventually became his new freedom, uh, um, as opposed to a new deal, his ec an economic philosophy. He meets with Wilson, and they start out at, with lunch and spend the next, uh, the, throughout the afternoon, drafting what became, this is in the summer of 1912, what became his, is it his new freedom? I always forget. I've, for, um, but, he, but became the essence of Wilson's um, economic 
and uh, social policies, especially economic policies. Yes. They became very close, you write. Become very close. He became, becomes Wilson's closest um, economic advisor, especially on economic issues. Night, w after Wilson's election, he wants to appoint um, Brandeis uh, Attorney General. But there's a backlash of anti-Semitism, and I'll maybe get to that when I talk about a Supreme Court nomination. And at that point, Wilson, it's, it's so strong and so staunch that Wilson decides he just can't appoint Brandeis, but he remains committed to the idea of appointing Brandeis to his cabinet or to the court, um, and he never uh, wavers from that. But, and he also keeps Brandeis informally as a, um, uh, as an advisor. And Brandeis, this starts, it's, it's a tradition much later with people like Henry Kissinger and others, but Brandeis commutes from um, Boston to Washington advising Wilson. Okay. And it's, yeah. A at this period of time, there has never been a, a Jewish Supreme never. Court justice. What's America's attitude towards that? Well, it's America's and Boston's, uh, and it's uh, particularly the uniqueness of Brandeis. Brand, um, the, the legal, uh, the business and legal establishment in Boston opposed Brandeis. As a Jew? As a Jew, yeah. And now, there, he was opposed also, by the way, there was some opposition to him because he was known as a people's attorney. He was the great progressive reformer. And for the conservative, and even William Howard Taft, who later became a great friend of Brandeis when they served on the court together, and who wasn't anti-Semitic, was outraged about Brandeis's nomination because he said, you know, he was a, a, a liberal reformer. And um, so too, in fact, when, um, if, I, if I can jump ahead to his Supreme Court nomination, this will maybe encapsulate it. You know, there, certainly there was opposition to Brandeis because um, by the conservative establishment, especially in uh, Boston. And you know, he needed the support of um, Henry Cabot Lodge, the senior senator in those days. Of, uh, had, had Lodge come out personally against him Wilson might have had to retract the nomination. Now, Lodge, it's an interesting story, was eventually came to support Brandeis, but the whole business and legal establishment led, in, um, and led by two people, but one of the most vociferous um, anti-Semitic uh, opponents of Brandeis was um, a, uh, a. Lawrence Lowell, the president of Harvard University, Brandeis' alma mater, who later ex um, achieved notoriety in the 1920s by trying to um, introduce a quota uh, in terms of Jewish admissions to Harvard. He brought together a letter of 55 of the most prominent uh, Boston Brahmins, the leaders of the uh, business and legal establishment in Boston, led by, among others, Charles Francis Adams, Jr., the grandson and great-grandson of presidents and the, uh, the chair of the Harvard Corporation. And they all, um, they testified against Brandeis at the Senate nominations. Now, his nomination process was the most um, contentious in American history. It really? lasted four months until Robert Bork's uh, nomination in 1987. By comparison, Gorsuch's recent nomination went through very quickly. For four months, there were um, uh, the Senate hearings went on, and uh, anti and anti-Semitism was at the um, uh, foundation of the opposition to Brandeis. From whom? Um, from people like A. Lawrence Lowell, from um, Henry Higginson, who was the preeminent, he, uh, leader of the banking establishment um, in Boston, and also a close friend of J.P. Uh, Morgan, who was also against Brandeis and anti-Semitic. Higginson financed the opposition to Brandeis as being nominated as Attorney General um, in 1915. And that he won. And that he won. He didn't win in, 19, um, in 1916. Now, the opposition, it was... Um, the anti-Semitic opposition wasn't even veiled, uh, you know, most of the time. And out in the open. It was, at, it was completely out in the open. And, um, and once again, the irony is, too, to a certain degree, you know, Brandeis was not a religious Jew. Yeah. Brandeis did not wear his Judaism on his lapel, and, et cetera. And, but um, it was out in the open. 
But the, it was, there were counter, um, by the way, one of the people, his supporters, was, Honey, uh, was John Honey Fitz, Fitzgerald, the um, uh, Irish mayor of Boston, uh, the grandfather of John F. Kennedy, John Fitz, who he was named after, and uh, he was one of Grand, Brandeis's big supporters. That's in interesting. How did the Jewish community, if you know, how did the Jewish community either react to the attacks on Brandeis, and did they come to his defense? Publicly, they came to his defense. Privately, they weren't so happy. Why? Because he wasn't one of them, really. He wasn't, the, for Schiff, in fact, there's a whole correspondence. Schiff says all these nice things in public, but he would have preferred a Louis Marshall. See, Brandeis was so out of the mainstream in the leadership of the Jewish community. When the American Jewish Committee was formed in 1906, it was formed as a committee. Brandeis's name was put forward, and it was vetoed, saying, He's not, a, he's not part of the Jewish community. He's an ethical culturist. By the way, his, he was married, his uh, brother-in-law was Felix Adler, the founder of the ethical culture movement. Um, but for, uh, for most of the Jewish Republicans, um, he was too liberal. He was too much of a progressive reformer. And he wasn't considered a leader in the Jewish community. Okay, how did he get passed? He, um, you mean, how did he get... Uh, did he, yeah. yeah, he well, finally, finally got confirmed. Yeah, he finally gets confirmed. Um, and it's a, um, it's not a close, it's, uh, well, the, the answer to that in part is Woodrow Wilson had one uh, th benefit that President Obama didn't have in nominating Merrick Garland. He had a Democratic Senate. Wilson had a Democratic Senate. He was uh, able to call in enough of his chips, mm -hmm. as well as progressive Republicans like uh, La Follette from uh, Wisconsin voted for him as well. So the combination of a Democratic Senate and a substantial, uh, rep uh, somewhat substantial Republican vote. By the way, the most anti-Semitic reaction to Brandeis's appointment was by a fellow Supreme Court Justice, James McReynolds, who was a vicious anti-Semite, and later, who would later, when Cardozo was appointed, he wrote a, an impassioned letter to um, Herbert Hoover begging him not to afflict the court with another Hebrew. And he would not, there's a famous Supreme Court portrait in 1924 without one of the justices. McReynolds decided he would not sit, he would have had to sit next to Brandeis, and he would not sit for a photograph next to Brandeis. Amazing. But they, they overcame the anti-Semitism, and um, it, was a, it had a lot to do with the fact that it was a democratic uh, Senate. Okay. Um, oh, this is just at the end of World War I. Um, Oh, no, this is, yeah, but it's before the United States enters World War I. He's approved, he's, uh, his uh, nomination is confirmed in June of 1960. Okay. One last thing, many of Wilson's uh, staff, White House advisors, were incredulous that he was making such a controversial appointment when he had a very difficult election forthcoming in, in November 1916. He almost lost. By the way, against Charles Evans Hughes, who left the court. Hughes went to sleep that night, assuming he had won, and Wilson went to sleep assuming he had lost. A Dewey Truman situation. Very much so, very much so. Very interesting, very interesting. Do you know anything about how the Jewish community reacted when, lo and behold, we do have, for the first time, a Jewish member of the Supreme Court? With a great deal of pride, then, I think it was. And especially when, and afterwards, when Cardozo, when there were two Jews on the court, this was, you know, Brandeis became, I always say, by the 1930s, he was, with the possible exceptions of um, Albert Einstein, George Gershwin, and maybe Hank Greenberg, he was the best known Jew in the United States. And this gave, the, this was, you know, um, it's interesting because to this day, it's the judiciary in which Jews have had so much more prominence. There's still never been a Jewish president. Obviously, uh, Joe Lieberman's nomination as vice president was a major step. Uh, in, there's never been a Jewish speaker of the House. Um, maybe Chuck Schumer may become uh, the first Jewish majority leader, but it's been in the judiciary. And Jews took a great deal of pride. And it became one of the themes of my book also is the decline of anti-Semitism in the American legal profession. And um, first of all, the nominations of Jews to the Supreme Court took a part in that. And also, Brandeis started the tradition of appointing Jewish law clerks 
which uh, then Cardozo and Frankfurter found. So Jews were, took pride in that. Okay. Tremendously. What can you tell us, how do you, will you describe the most significant contribution Brandeis makes on the Supreme Court? Well, I guess, you know, what became a, not a cliche, a trade, it was always Holmes and Brandeis dissenting. Brandeis was a great, a great civil libertarian, um, and uh, he, in terms of freedom of speech, was one of his great, uh, um, in terms of his, his judicial uh, decisions, um, he, made, uh, he made a great contribution to freedom of speech, but also he invented almost a new chapter uh, in law, uh, privacy. The freedom of privacy, or what's uh, the uh, the principle of privacy? The principle of privacy, and he and his law, um, former law partner and classmate at Harvard wrote a famous Harvard Law Review: the right to privacy. The idea that uh, where just as there was a right to the freedom of speech, uh, etc., um, uh, there was uh, there was a constitutional or at least legal right to privacy, even though it's not explicitly stated in, in the, the Constitution. Constitution. Precisely. And it was uh, one of the future solicitor generals, um, Irvin uh, was the dean of Harvard Law School, said that Brandeis really, maybe that's his greatest contribution. He almost single-handedly developed a whole new chapter in the law. Mm -hmm. um, now, interesting, and I'm a great admirer of Brandeis, one area that he was, did not take a uh, role in was uh, civil rights. Um, Frankfurter himself was one of the founders of the NAACP, and Frankfurter appointed the first African-American law clerk. Brandeis came from Louisville. And, you know, he and Wilson were both, you know, uh, expatriate Southerners who came west to make their fame and fortune. And there's so much we could spend a whole hour about the, you know, um, I've, spent, I've taught at Princeton too. And uh, my wife went to college there of what's happened at Princeton now because of uh, all the attention on Wilson being a racist. But Brandeis wasn't a racist, but he never, he didn't take a role in, he often voted with the conservative majority on what we would call today civil rights. Very interesting. Uh, you do say Brandeis becomes one of the giants of American yes. Jewry in his generation. Yeah. And you, you know, you mentioned him among the other greats, Albert Einstein, George Gershwin. And the only, by the way, the only um, justice of a Supreme Court after whom a great university has been named. Okay. I asked you what his, what his contribution on the court was. You spoke about it. And by the way, he was always considered one of the three greatest justices in American history. Because? Uh, because of his, a lot of his dissenting opinions have over the years become the law of the land. He and um, Holmes together were uh, uh, so many of their, um, they were part of the liberal uh, majority on the court for so many years. And at, at a given point in time, the court catches up to Brandeis. Precisely. Mm -hmm. Precisely. Is that, by the way, his legacy? In other words, when you say he yes. is one of the... Yeah four greatest American Jews of his generation. Okay, yeah. And then we talk about the fact that on the court, his contribution really is, un is appreciated more later. Yeah. What was his, what made him so important and esteemed uh, at his time? In his own lifetime. Well, by the way, he's also, I would consider him also one of the great, one of the preeminent Jewish presidential advisors in history before he even got on the court. If there would be a book which, you know, on, um, on the, the president's Jews, the, you know, presidential advisors. But no, I think um, it was in the Jewish, com the Jewish community took a, a tremendous amount of pride in having, it was symbolically in that sense. You know, uh, the, you know, the average didn't know about how religious he was or not religious, what he observed or it didn't. It didn't matter. It didn't matter at all. Just, uh, you know, just like Hank Greenberg symbolically, I have to send you an article I wrote about, was when he didn't go, the one, you know, when he didn't play on Yom Kippur Rosh that day. Yeah, Rosh Hashanah. Okay. But that symbolically was so important. For Brandeis, the idea of a Jewish seat on the court, which, and the idea that there was, um, um, that there was a prominent Jew who was on the Supreme Court, that symbolically was uh, American Jews beginning to come of age. That uh, this was only in America 
could you? And I think that was it. It was symbolic. I, I don't think the average Jew knew, uh, you know, there's a Brandeis camp, there's a Brandeis University. But he was legitimately brilliant. Oh, brilliant. Oh, he was, you know, uh, I should have said, he, uh, it's, oh, it may or may not be apocryphal, but w first of all, he graduated uh, Harvard Law School uh, before, before he had turned 20. He had to get a special dispensation to pass the bar in uh, Massachusetts because you had to be 21. But he uh, graduated with the highest scholastic average in the history of Harvard Law School before or since. Now, I don't know if anyone has tabulated it directly in recent years, but it was always, he was one of the most brilliant. Now, he, unlike Frankfurter, unlike Cardozo and others, he didn't write, and unlike Stephen Breyer, he didn't like write books of legal scholarship. But he's probably one of the greatest legal minds ever produced in America. Okay. Most Jews know the names. Yeah. Louis Brandeis, Benjamin Cardoza, Felix Frankfurter. It's not that Arthur Goldberg isn't known, uh, let me talk but, about it, but it seems to us yeah. that the three greats, the forefathers sort of, yes, the in, giants. of giants of the Supreme Court who were Jews are those three. So I want to go to number two. Talk to me about Benjamin Cardoza. Okay. Benjamin Cardoza came from one of the most eminent Sephardic families uh, in America. He was a direct descendant of... Um, uh, was Gershon Mendes Seixas, who was the rabbi of Shirith Israel, the Spanish-Portuguese synagogue, um, at the time of the American Revolution, and one of the 14 members of the clergy to give um, benedictions at Was George Washington's inauguration. Um, also, the first uh, Jew, at, on the recommendation of Alexander Hamilton, to serve on the, um, board, uh, uh, the board of governors of Columbia University, Columbia College, and the next Jew would be his descendant, Benjamin Cardozo. Cardozo was, uh, amongst his first cousins were Emma Lazarus, and there's a who's who. Uh, another cousin was the uh, Manhattan Borough President. Uh, he was related to everyone in the Sephardic community. Um, and uh, he was, um, it, there was a scandal. His father, uh, who was a judge before him, uh, was involved with the Tweed Ring, with Boss Tweed, and he had to re resign uh, the New York uh, State Court, uh, Supreme Court, in disgrace. And Benjamin Cardozo's life was, was devoted to um, re rehabilitating the family image. And I mean, there's a, in fact, I have one section I put, you know, in which it was, um, uh, that was his goal in life, uh, really, which he, which he uh, did, um, which he eventually achieved. What was his contribution on okay. the court? Well, okay. And by the way, first, the one thing just before the court, uh, Louis Marshall was one of his great backers and great supporters. His contribution, this is interesting. Sadly, his contribution on the court was not as great. He was, for many years before, the judge and chief judge of the New York State Court of Appeals. And in legal scholarship, some of his greatest renown are his judicial decisions when he was on that court. Um, uh, wh wh by the time he was appointed um, uh, to the Supreme Court, he was already in declining health. He was on the court for six years. There were one or two of his uh, decisions, the Palgrave decision, uh, the Polko decision, and others that are considered landmark. But for example, most of the, his decisions for which he's best known were decisions he rendered as chief judge of the New York State Supreme Court. Also, he wrote some of the great works of legal scholarship mm -hmm. the, of, of any justice in history. Um, and he did have a much more Jewish yes. essence Yes. Than did Brandeis. Yes, he did. He was a um, grew up in the Spanish Portuguese synagogue yes. when he w where it was bar mitzvah. But now too, it's interesting. He ceased. He always had a seat because the family, the, the, his family, always had seats at uh, Sheriff Israel at the Spanish Portuguese synagogue. He was what you might call today a non-practicing Orthodox Jew. Um, when he would go to shul, it would only be an Orthodox shul, but he would go very rarely as an adult. When he was home, at, you know, and sometimes he would go uh, to Sheriff Israel and, and on the high holidays, but he didn't go off. Now, he did not, uh, he had a kosher home, 
He had a kosher uh, home. He never married. He lived with his sister, who he was very devoted to, and he cared for years, uh, for many years when she was in ill health. And, um, uh, but, um, by the way, when um, I, part of the thing that a, a chapter in that, about, in a subchapter is called Redemption, when he finally gets on the court and redeems the family name. But he was much more Jewishly knowledgeable. Brandeis was an Amharic, yeah. uh, basically. I, yeah. I hate to say that, but as a great admirer of Brandeis, you know, uh, uh, Cardozo was much more learned. In fact, as one of the life trustees of the synagogue, he comes back to the synagogue already when he's a practicing lawyer. And there was a big, there was an effort to reform Sheriff Israel and to have mixed seating. And he gives a very legalistic, a passionate, now mind you, he never, he never went to shul on Shabbos, but he gave the argument for keeping um, a mechitza there and for keeping uh, against mixed seating. And his argument, and he did it constitutionally by the bylaws of the synagogue, and his argument prevailed. But he was, but he was Jewishly knowledgeable. And one of the reasons it's not known that he and Brandeis did not hit it off in Washington. And I'll, I'll tell you one, if I can tell you one Please. story about that. Um, it's often thought that uh, much is made of the, the great friendship between Brandeis and Stephen Wise. Stephen Wise was much closer to Cardozo. It's an interesting story. Stephen Wise's wife, uh, Louise Waterman Wise, was, had been, before she married Wise, a close friend of Cardozo's sister. Who he, and, uh, and they were devoted to Cardozo, so much so that when um, Cardozo went to Washington, Stephen and uh, 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 Louis Weiss wrote a letter to Brandeis, who of course they knew well, saying that, you know, our dear friend, and they used his last name, Cardozo is coming, you know, he's one of our dearest friends, we know, uh, but he's not, you know, he's shy, he's, he's a bachelor, please, will you help us out, will you, you know, will you invite him into your home? Will you make him part of your home? It would mean so much to them, and they didn't. Brandeis especially. It's not only serving the tray food, but he, uh, they, the two of them just didn't hit it off. Interesting. And, yeah. By the way, a university is named after Brandeis. Yeah. A law school is named after Cardoza. And a law school after Brandeis, too. Yes. In Louisville, but you're right. I should have mentioned that. No, no, A no. very good law school. Yes. The third justice, Frankfurter. Felix Frankfurter, what's his story? His story is fascinating. He, uh, very ambitious, he comes to the uh, States at the age of 12 not knowing a word of English. From? Uh, from Austria. Oh, I thought, Austria. Yeah, uh, from Austria. His, um, now, um, he's a prodigy. He learns English so well. Uh, very soon. By the way, one of the uh, the only Jewish justice, only one of the three justices in the history of the Supreme Court, not born in the United States. He goes to see. Yes, by the way, Brandeis and Cardoza are born in the United States. Yes. 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 Brand. Yeah. Brandeis is educated in Germany for a few years. His parents go before uh, before law school, but he's born in the United yes. States. By the way, just one more footnote. It's interesting. Was there any sense in the Jewish community? that Cordoza was the first real Jewish justice. I think there was, in some sense, yeah. And also, by the way, I just have to bring this in now. When so uh, uh, Sonia Sotomayor was nominated by, um, uh, was appointed to the court, everywhere it was talked about she was the first Hispanic. But in many ways, in fact, I talk about it in the book, and I, t I spoke with, uh, with Cardozo's biographer about that. Um, he was technically the first Hispanic justice. I understand. Which, uh, but you know what, that, what is meant. Yeah, of course, yes. of course. Okay. Felix Frankfurter. Okay, Felix Frankfurter. Very ambitious, brilliant. He goes to City College and graduates in a couple of years. Um, his cl classmate and lifelong friend is Morris Raphael Cohen, the great philosopher. Uh, the famous philosopher. Um, he then goes, uh, but he's born in poverty, is, uh, um, and uh, in an ortho into an Orthodox home. I'll come. Let me. I'll come back to the Jewishness uh, in a minute. But then he uh, g goes to Harvard Law School, and that's where he always wanted to be part of the Brahmin establishment. 
except for Brandeis, all of his mentors were people like um, Henry Stimson, like Harvey Bundy, the father of McGeorge Bundy. Um, they were all, the, all the people, the, the WASP establishment were his men mentors. He graduates first in his class at Harvard Law School. He has a famous dinner, lunch rather, in 1906 at the Harvard Club in New York with another young law school graduate, FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. The two of them are big, politically ambitious, come from opposite, you know, uh, you know, Roosevelt is from the, you know, um, from the- uh, Aristocracy. You know, the well. aristocracy, really, I was trying to, the ar wealthy aristocracy, and uh, they remain on and off in touch for many, many years. Um, and uh, eventually, it's 33 years after that luncheon that uh, FDR appoints him to the court. So Frankfurter um, goes, uh, graduates first in his class, has glowing recommendations from the dean of the law school, can't get a job in any Wall Street law firm because of his Jewishness. He finally gets a job um, in uh, um, one firm, which and I have the name of it there, but at which the senior partner takes him aside and says, young man, you've got a great future. May I suggest that you change your name, you anglicize your name. Now, Frankfurt, as I'll tell you in a minute, was completely non-Jewish. Uh, un that he would not do. He said, this is my father's name. He, he refused to. He stayed at the firm for a year. Then he joined Henry Stimson, um, who became one of his great mentors, and he became his campaign manager when Stimson ran for governor of New York. When Stimson lost, he became Secretary of War in the Wilson administration, and Frankfurter follows him to uh, Washington. And by the way, there he reconnects with FDR, who is the Assistant Secretary of the Navy. And a fascinating, there's a really an interesting uh, thing there. Um, FDR invites, without checking with Eleanor, invites uh, Frank uh, Felix for dinner. And she is outraged. You know, Eleanor Roosevelt in later life is, you know, considered the great, and she was the great humanitarian. It, as a young girl, she grew up, she was part of an era in which uh, she was anti-Semitic. And she was outraged how, and she wrote to Sarah Delano, uh, FDR's mother, who was very anti-Semitic. She was so, uh, she invited um, Felix over, and to her surprise, he was good company, but he was so Jewy. And then the same thing happened when FDR had the audacity to invite Bernard Baruch, who the three of them were working together. And she later overcame this, but it's an interesting footnote. Um, 1914, Bran uh, um, Frankfurter, uh, and this with the help of Brandeis and uh, Stimson and others, uh, is appointed to the faculty of Harvard Law School. The first Jew ever, to, and the only Jew who would be on the faculty in Harvard Law School until the 1940s. And he then becomes a very prominent uh, um, public intellectual and legal scholar. He writes, he, he, he's one of the founders of um, uh, the New Republic magazine. And um, he uh, is um, involved, uh, he later become F, becomes FDR's advisor when FDR is elected governor of New York in 1928. But something we might want to come back to also, he writes, it's not, when you're, um, I talk a lot about my book about the extrajudicial activities of the justices, including Brandeis. When you're on the court, you're not supposed to be taking an, after, an active role in uh, politics and, or in writing about politics. Brandeis and Frankfurter had a relationship. Brandeis was a multimillionaire. Uh, he was a millionaire in, by the time he was 30. Frankfurter always had problems with money. Brandeis paid him an allowance each year to write to, under his name to publish articles in the New Republic, the Harvard Law Review, and things that Brandeis wrote. In that way, Brandeis, which was completely um, improper, helped uh, draft New Deal legislation under FDR. But it would all be under Frankfurter's name for most of the part. Okay, Frankfurter emerges. Um, as one of FDR's uh, advisors, and he always, um, he, what's the word, he cultivated the, the, um, the, the Protestant establishment, which I'll come back to with the Jewishness, and he becomes FDR's advisor. FDR uh, offers him uh, the position of Solicitor General, which has always been kind of a stepping stone to the Supreme Court. To the surprise of many, he turns it down, 
um, because he wanted, he was an Anglophile, he had been offered a, to teach at Oxford, which was a dream of a lifetime. Many people, you know, FD, uh, FDR told him he was foolish. He said, you know, it, it would be much easier to appoint you to the Supreme Court if you were Solicitor General. It's going to be much more difficult if you're a professor. He did that, but then he returned and was continued to be one of FDR's advisors. And he stood by FDR when Frankfurt, when Brandeis and Cardozo and the liberals on the court um, opposed, FDR tried to pack the court, Correct. his famous, uh, by, to, uh, in, uh, to increase the number of justices so he could appoint justices uh, who were liberals to uh, counterbalance the, uh, FDR stood, by, uh, Frankfurt stood by him to Brandeis's, Brandeis's chagrin. He was always loyal to him, and in 1939, he appoints uh, uh, Frankfurter to the court. Uh, and he succeeds, he's appointed actually to succeed Cardozo, who had just died. But for two weeks, Frankfurter and Brandeis sit together on the court, and then Brandeis retires. Okay. What was Frankfurter's contribution on the court? Well, his contribution on the court is not considered as great as Cardozo's was, was, or, or especially as Brandeis's, already he was he was kind of eclectic. He um, he started taking it, uh, during before it was and even when the liberal uh, Warren court he started uh, taking uh, uh, he became a uh, proponent of judicial restraint and he started taking ma many more conservative positions than would have ever been anticipated. Although he did help bring about the court consensus for Brown versus Board of Education. And that may have been his singularly greatest contribution. Okay. The, he voted against the reli a religious freedom of the, um, oh, uh, the Adve Seventh-day Adventists. He took positions that um, were, um, and on immigration, he was an immigrant. He took a very staunch position uh, on against uh, some immigration decisions, which um, which surprised a lot of people. So when he finally resigned, when he retired from the court, and he had become somewhat of a curmudgeon. And here's the interesting thing, and part of this was he alienated when he before he was on the court, he was able to he was he was charming he was ambitious he cultivated everybody anybody who was important he was able to cultivate. On the court, something changed. He was, he, uh, as much as I'll talk about later, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was known for her civility and bringing people together. He qu couldn't get along with uh, William O. Douglas, with Hugo Black, with any of his fe fellow justices. And it got to the point where almost Dafka, if one would vote one way, he would vote the other way. And it was a paradoxical because before, on his road up to the court, he was able to cultivate everybody. And here at, on the court, it was, um, there's a lot that's been written about it. He, um, he wouldn't even, he would either not speak to one, especially Hugo Black and William O. Douglas. And there were others, and otherwise he just sometimes seemed, they were on two different wings of the court. Interesting. All appointed by FDR, by the way. It does seem as if Justices who are appointed for life, right, right, unless they retire, very often they're pigeonholed and thought to be uh, ideologues to the left or the right. The right. Yes. They get on the court and they move. They, they move. evolve and uh, they tend to yes. move toward the center. Yes, yes. You found that true? I found that true. By the way, a recent example of that was uh, David Souter, who was nominated by George H.W. Bush. Um, uh, uh, and, you know, moved to the liberal center, and he voted. And even, um, you know, even Kennedy, who's going to be retiring, was uh, appointed by Reagan and was voted with the conservatives, but it was also a swing vote for the other way. Yes. Yeah. So it seems to me that sometimes the politicization of the Supreme Court yeah, yeah. is really only a function of partisan politics, and that That's true. if one cares about quality, in terms of the Supreme Court, what you want is a justice who has proven, has a proven record of both integrity yes. and yes. judicial wisdom. Yeah. And you don't worry about whether they lean left or right. Yes. They're going to move to the center once they're appointed. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. You agree with me? I do agree with you, yeah. Okay. Talk to me about Frank Footer's Jewishness. Okay. 
here is, this is an enigma, and, uh, it's paradoxical. He left, uh, at the, while a teenager, he basically um, left Judaism. Um, he married the daughter of a Protestant minister. Um, he never set foot in a synagogue um, throughout his adult life, except to give a talk, but never to daven, never to pray. Um, his, um, and I'll come back to one thing during the Holocaust afterwards, but the real incredible thing is he, um, he wanted to ingratiate himself, and he did, with the WASP establishment. That was his you know, uh, goal in life. By the way, when he got married to his pr the Protestant wife, Cardozo officiated at the civil ceremony, and his wife uh, and his mother would not, wouldn't attend. In fact, he later wrote, a, there's a book of his correspondence with Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr., and he told, he said, he told Holmes about, well, in, our, in the Jewish religion, you know, it's expected that you're going to marry someone, and he tries to explain to Holmes uh, why his mother didn't attend his uh, wedding. And, um, but what, uh, the paradoxical thing here then to come is what, to, unbeknownst to his Protestant wife or to any of his close friends, in his will, he asked that the Kaddish be recited at his funeral. And specifically that he asked that Louis Henkin, a uh, very prominent, I, I'll tell you, law professor, he just died a few years ago at Columbia University, recite the Kaddish. Now, uh, Louis Henkin was um, the son of one of the preeminent Orthodox rabbis in America, Rav Henkin, um, the first graduate of Yeshiva College to go to Harvard Law School. He clerked for Frankfurter. Frankfurter, who was also a self-described agnostic, was always impressed that Henkin um, would leave early on Friday, would not work on the Jewish holidays, etc. And he always said that Henkin was his only close friend who was a practicing Orthodox Jew. And there was something about that that impressed him. And Henkin himself didn't know about this until his will was uh, read. And, but he had said uh, to um, a friend before he died um, that, you know, uh, another friend, he said that, I came into this world as a Jew. Most of my life I did not li live as a Jew, but I want to leave this world as a Jew. And for him, the recitation of the Kaddish was his link, was his connection to the Judaism of his youth that he had left. Okay. It is so interesting to hear the way you describe the Jewishness of the first major, in some way iconic, Jewish members of the Supreme Court. Yeah. Each one has a very different kind of Jewish identity. Very much so. Brandeis, Cardoza, yeah. and yeah. Frankfurter. And yet, as far as the Jewish world is concerned, they are all oh, Jewish. 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 Yes. Yes, very much so. Yes. And as you said, I mean, without, the whole idea of a Jewish seat on the court symbolically meant a lot to American Jews, I think. The idea that when one Jew would retire and another or pass away and another would be appointed, this was, uh, this was important to Jews, regardless of what they, how they were as Jews. David, you are marvelous. Oh, thank you so much. This was such an education for us. It was exciting. Oh. You have written a superb book. Oh. Again, it's a very easy read. It's a joy to read. Thank you for giving me so oh. much time. I hope you and I will have many opportunities to be together. I hope so, too. It this was is, a joy. And thank you so much for inviting me. And if I can say I've been such a fan of, uh, of not only L'chaim, the interview, but of JBS. And it's, I'm honored to be here with you Thank today. you, my friend. Thank, thank you. you. David Dallin, whose superb book is entitled Jewish Justices of the Supreme Court from Brandeis to Kagan, Their Lives and their legacies. It's published by Brandeis Press. And of course, it's available in Jewish bookstores everywhere and on Amazon. I recommend this book highly. If you like history and you like American Jewish history, this book should be a part of your library. It's a, a wonderful gift to anybody you know who cares and is interested in Jewish life and Jewish history. As always, I invite you to be in touch with me with any thoughts or comments you may have to any of the ideas you've heard on these editions of L'Chaim with David. Please email me, write me, post on our Facebook page, tweet me. 
I look forward to hearing from many of you. And if you want to be in touch with David Dallin, you can do so by writing to me, and I will pass it on to him. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. L'chaim, my friends, to life. of Jewish education in media. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS, the Jewish Broadcasting Service, with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the JBS homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM, to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.